me to raise my voice. Is that the case? It doesn't make much sense to say, uh, wave at me if you can't hear, but uh, can everybody hear? Okay, alhamdulillah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidil Anbiya wa Khatim al Mursaleen Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina wa Ismati Amrina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa atba'ihi wa dhurriyatihi wa azwajihi ajma'in We're just rounding off this uh, brief but uh, hopefully youthful tour of uh, Islam's wisdom on how we deal with the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us bodies. This is the way he's intended us to be, not disembodied consciousnesses, but we are in these physical forms. And if we're talking about what is characteristic of Islam, the khasa'is of Islam, we might say that it is a profoundly embodied style of religion a way of being human, that the fiqh is about how we engage as consciousnesses with the physical form in which we have been uh, insufflated, into which we have been breathed, and also how we engage as physical forms with each other, which is to do with adab and akhlaq. One of the uh, troubling and painful features of the modern style of living is that uh, people don't really know how to inhabit their bodies terribly well. And there are certain forms of religion that treat the body as just uh, uh, an appendage, a nuisance, even a kind of cage. The soul is what we really are, and in a dualistic way, the body is something just to punish to mortify, like the Jain monks, whose supreme form of devotion is to starve themselves to death. That's liberation, moksha, you're free. Uh, Islam doesn't go in for that, and again this is part of the Surat Mustaqim. We are not slaves, inshallah, to the impulses of our biology, but neither do we declare war on those impulses. These are things that are part of our fitrah, that are part of what it, Allah intends us to be as embodied human beings. He hasn't given us bodies just so that we can try and get out of them again. We only get out of them uh, when we die. And even at the mahshar and in the world of eternity, we are with our bodies again. They are an integral part of what we are. And uh, a lot of modern science would say, of course, so much of how we behave is to do with whether we're healthy or whether we're sick, whether we're young, whether we're old, whether we're male, whether we're female, um, the genetic shuffle, all of those things, elementary things you do with the body. There is a way of uplifting and sacralizing everything. The body is not a secular space. It is part of our sanctity and part of the process of sanctification. And that again we take to be a consequence of Tawheed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the universal and the absolute and the all-encompassing muhit. Nothing escapes him in his knowledge or in any of his qualities or his attributes. And... Uh, the human creature whose heart is to mirror the absolute and to be a place in which the divine qualities can manifest themselves once we have purified that heart also has to be part of a project that is totalizing because there is nothing in the world that is actually secular there can be nothing in our lives that is actually secular everything has a right and a wrong way of being the details of the Sunnah and the Sharia are there in order to help us with that. And again, considering our situation as recipients of the final dispensation, obviously different from the Sharia, 
that were given to earlier prophets need to be aware and grateful uh, uh, for the fact that uh, we have these detailed guidelines because we are in a world in which human beings are fi makanin sahiq they've been taken to a very very remote place in terms of how human beings historically were far from the sacred far from ritual far from prayer far from traditional values of family and honor far from traditional understandings of gender far from just about everything that historically constituted human normalcy for untold thousands of years we are abnormal the sunnah gives us a way of recreating and re-establishing normality in everything that we do there is a right and a wrong way and the sunnah wherever that's possible because sometimes our situations are particular to ourselves our generation our technologies and don't have an immediate precedent in the sunnah but wherever possible it does give us the ability to make that choice and as we saw in the first lecture to rise above the kind of uh, bovine chasing of immediate gratification and put us in a place where we are actually choosers in the sense that we acquire the things that uh, we do as part of the total matrix of creation and the body is is very much the basis of that there are a few issues that uh, have contemporary salience that it may help us to reflect upon in this context um, one of these issues is uh, exactly what we mean by gender the second of these shahwatain is the, the desire for the opposite sex and we've seen the sane and balanced way in which Islam acknowledges that and helps us to avoid being hurt by excessive following of our own instincts in this imbalanced modern world not only are there really no boundaries and everybody you know, proclaims proudly their desire to gratify themselves gay pride marches being an example of that people are proud of these things rather than um, shy about them in this strange age even the principle of gender has been lost and in consequence the polarity that exists between the genders uh, whose proper consummation is the institution of marriage has come under a lot of pressure marriage has been desacralized and for many young people it's not clear what it's for anyway nowadays a romantic gesture perhaps or a declaration of the intention to remain faithful but nothing more than that the Islamic image could not be further from that Islamic image is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created humanity in two alternate and complementary forms and the reason for this is that there should be uh, Sakina Khalaqa lakum min anfusikum azwajan litaskunu ilayha He created for you from your own kind spouses that you might find rest in them A lot of relationships nowadays don't seem to produce that as much as we would like them to and Much of that has to do with the fact that nobody can properly understand what it is to have a gender uh, and the modern world as is perhaps its central paradox its extraordinary proliferation of information about detailed things but our traditional fundamentals uh, it leaves us in the dark and particularly leaves young people and adolescents in the dark they just have to work it out for themselves there are few boundaries other than the usual utilitarian liberal ones of do what you like as long as nobody seems to be hurt in the process otherwise young people are given these impulses and a world that capitalizes on these impulses very few boundaries and as a result many of them are hurting forms of predation become common forms of abuse become common and all kinds of disorders become common as a result because this is not how human beings are supposed to be so 
we find ourselves as uh, thankful custodians of the Sunnah and the Fitra in a time where people would really like to know what's right and what's wrong, would like to know the boundaries, who does what in a marriage, what a man is, what a woman is, where they can go sexually, where they can't go sexually, what is attraction to the same sex, and the world has not given them any kind of guidance other than do what you like as long as nobody gets hurt as the only remaining ground rule. And a lot of people in consequence are confused. So if we take some of these issues, um, one of them is the question of same-sex attraction, which in this book Al-Ghazali does briefly deal with. Uh, this has been complexified by the fact that uh, the biology, although still contested, seems to suggest that as with many other forms of human behavior, there is a genetic uh, as well as a, a socialized basis for such forms of behavior. And so the question arises as to if something is in your genes and Islam is the religion of the fitra, doesn't that mean that it's natural to act upon those impulses and that therefore they are what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do? And there are organizations still cautious and uh, tentative of gay Muslims now which are trying to advance this theology. Such an aberration is only possible in the context of a religious culture which has uh, succumbed to the contemporary insistence that happiness comes about when you do what you feel like doing as long as nobody seems to get hurt in the process. Religion, I'm afraid, is not that. Religion grants us happiness through this sakina, but it doesn't say that it's about doing what you feel like doing. It really isn't. No religion is about doing what you feel like doing. An impulse is not the same as uh, uh, an ethical principle. This should be fairly evident. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly has created us as these two genders, and he could have created one gender or three genders, which would make you know, life for uh, um, aunties and our mothers even more interesting in terms of choosing spouses. Three genders would really make an Asian wedding even more colorful. But two, two genders, <laughs> two genders are what we have. And uh, alhamdulillah, we are... Uh, thankful Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam what greater gift was ever given to anyone than Sayyidatna Hawa so that he would not be alone so that he would have this Sakina he woke up and there she was in her magnificence and the correct attitude therefore of men and women should be basically shukr gratitude and that's how it used to be with Muslim marriages because people had a low sense of expectation really a low, uh, a realistically low opinion of what they deserved. When they were given a spouse, they just couldn't believe their good fortune. And it didn't matter too much if they didn't have the right kind of teeth or if one eye was not quite right or if they didn't know how to cook. People were so grateful to have a spouse. They said, Alhamdulillah, and they found a place in society and the children usually would come. And it was all on the basis of hamd and shukr. Nowadays, because we've been taught to be discerning consumers, so we don't just eat anything, but it has to be the stuff that the New York Times has said is the dish of the month, and the car has to be like this, and our holidays have to be like that, and we have this big sense of entitlement, and we say everything has to be perfect. And very frequently, uh, we find that we apply that to um, our spouses, and that's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to do لا يبغض مؤمن مؤمنة إن ساءه منها خلق رضي منها خلق آخر No believing man should ever dislike a believing woman. If he finds one trait in her displeasing, he will find another trait in her uh, in which he finds pleasure. And this is how we ought to be. Just be grateful for what we've got. And when we are grateful for what we've got, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show us the amazing things that are possible in uh, a loving and a sincere and a prayerful and a believing relationship. And this should be very simple. The religion of the fitra should find relationships very easy. The religion of tawadu, of humility, should find the shukr, 
necessary for a good marriage, very easy. A religion in which we've been taught to be content with simple things should find domestic life not very demanding. Who cares if there isn't much in the cupboard and we don't have the latest vacuum cleaner. We're zohad, we're traveling to the akhirah, this is not what it's all about. And we have this qina, the very good basis for a good marriage because so many arguments are over financial things. And if you're um, radin bil qalil, you're happy with little, then because there's so much istifadat al-mal these days, so much money around pouring out of the earth in great geezers, alhamdulillah, there is enough for almost all of us to go around. But unfortunately we have this uh, fussiness because of our sense of expectation and our desire to look good in the eyes of others. We need to overcome that and simply accept that we're travelers through this world. Nothing is perfect. No one is perfect. We're very grateful to have been given a spouse and an opportunity to serve and an opportunity to have children, an opportunity to be part of the chain of being and in four or five generations our names will be forgotten and it will be profoundly over and our souls will be moving on to the Akhirah and we will be judged on the basis of how we spent these few years and particularly how we dealt with um, our partners and that's really what counts and that is what will make a good marriage and relationship. This other issue uh, is more troubling, this issue of the those who are attracted to people who are not the opposite sex, even though the polarity of the genders is a fundamental principle of biology and of Islam and of the Qur'an. The male is not like the female. And male and female are frequently cited as principles in the Qur'an. Probably again, although I'm no expert, more than in any other world scripture. Uh, and if you read the seerah and you look at the lives of the Sahaba and the Sahabiyat, you can see the, the glory of each gender. The glory of the male warrior risking death and mutilation for the sake of defending the Muslims. Uh, the, the magnificence of, of the male at his best, at his priestly warrior best. And also the magnificence of the female at her nurturing beautiful best. And you can see something of the joy that the Sahaba and the Sahabiyat found in their own genders. You can see it in, in the lives and in the, the marriages of the Sahaba. But they are different. And as a result, the experience of the sacred is subtly different. So that for our formal worship in the Masajid, it is the man who is at the front, who is, as it were, holding within himself, or subsequently in his hands, the uncreated word. For the female, the great privilege of the female access to the sacred is holding in herself and in her hands the miracle of the ruh as it comes again into the world. That's a privilege that women have that men don't have. She has within herself another self. And in Turkish, the word for pregnant is iki janle, which means two-souled. Now, this is the privilege, the mystery of the woman who has the rahim within herself, which is, as the hadith says, the name which is connected by derivation to the divine name ar-Rahman. She is miraculously partaking in the process of new creation itself. And what she has within herself is that وَنَفَخْنَا فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِنَا There is a time at which the fetus is quickened where she contains within herself something that is not of dunya. Something that is of... The ruh is min amri rabbi. Eternal. That which comes into her will go on forever. That which comes into her is the most important thing for which the heavens and the earth were created and she uniquely is its privileged vessel and bearer. And every woman, whether she thinks about it or not, intuitively knows that, that this is a, a sacred magnificence that she carries preciously within her. And when she holds her child, the way a woman can and a man never 
quite can because it's hers, it's of her, her flesh. She is carrying within herself a sign and a ruh. She is carrying within her hands her own privileged access to the transcendence. Of course, she has the Qur'an as well, and she has full access to the Qur'an. And of course, the man can hold the baby as well, but there is a distinction. None of that necessarily plays out in terms of the strict deduction of gender roles in society. This is more to do with the inherent nature of uh, the spirituality of the male and the female. And it certainly isn't a hierarchical thing. You can't say one is better than the other because it's, this is beyond comparison uh, or measurement. Uh, but Islam takes this very seriously. So what are we to make of alternative sexualities where this great miracle, the purpose of all human sexuality, which is the, the introduction into the world of the miracle of new life, where does that fit? Well, of course, it can't. Even although there are deals in some Western democracies where you can have surrogate parenthood and... Uh, the like of that, but it's not the same. It is not the same as carrying within yourself the miracle of uh, an eternal soul, an eternal spirit. It can't be equal. The two practices cannot be equal. The womb is the miracle which leads on to new life, the eternity of the child in the next world, and endless generations to come. The womb is the miraculous gateway to fecundity and to eternity. The other passage leads to dead matter. The two are not equivalent. That doesn't mean we are phobic, it just means that we acknowledge the reality of the fitra and of Allah's creation. And we have to be very clear about this and clear with those who have the wrong inclinations or think they have the wrong inclinations. And clear with those who say, why are you phobic, why don't you believe in equality? Well, there are certain things about the human condition that are inherently not equal. A hundred percent of people who have babies are women. That's not, <laughs> that's not an egalitarian statistic. That's the way in which Allah has determined that things will be. So there will be many things in which there isn't a parity and there can't be a parity. That's the nature of our species. So we need to be clear about this. And those who say, oh, the passage is Tattuna al-Rijala Shahwatan min Duni Nisa. Sayyidina Lut alayhi salam said to his people, are you following men rather than women in lust? And they will say these gay Muslims on the new websites, and I'm not quite sure who's putting up the money, but they have money. Uh, they will say, oh, no, this is about love. This is not about desire. Well, there's nothing wrong with a man loving a man because we all love Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we love the awliya, we love the ulama, we love each other's tahad or tahab or mutual love between the believers is a given. But desire is something else. And what that passage in the Qur'an which unambiguously prohibits these practices is, prohibit, is, is saying is it's shahwa. If that shahwa is there, that shahwa is something that one of Allah's prophets condemned. And that's really unambiguous. Scripturally, biologically, and spiritually, these two practices are not equal, they are not equivalent, and the one can very easily be a kind of a caricature of the other, an insult to the miracle of the womb to claim that it is equate, can be equated with the other thing. That's um, an insult to, to women. So we need to be strong about this because many people are now barking at us and telling us to be less homophobic and we just have to say, well, the fact that people have an impulse has no moral significance. There are many uh, forms of human behavior, including compulsive behavior, that are obviously destructive, that have a genetic basis. Arson, for instance, or particular forms of violent, recurrent violent behavior. Often you can see it running in families, you can see it in people's genetic makeup, and this is becoming clearer and clearer to scientists. But nobody is saying that because people have a strong innate impulse to do those things, that therefore those things should be legalized or that they're morally right. So where does it come from? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give certain people in the process of this genetic shuffle that particular uh, impulse? Well, the answer is, I'm afraid, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not just have names of Jamal, but he has names of Jalal. Names of beauty and also names of majesty. 
He is the one who creates cute little babies. He is also the one who creates exploding galaxies. He is the one who creates heaven. He also creates hell. Uh, and there is a dimension of rigor in creation, which means that everybody has a particular test or weakness that they will be confronted with repeatedly in their lives that they have to overcome if they're going to make spiritual progress. For some people, it might be a chronic dishonesty or a willingness to lie. For other people, it might be an apparently insuperable arrogance or a meanness. There can be many things that we have an inclination to. For some people, it might be the wrong kind of sexual orientation. And there may be, again, in all of these cases, some genetic basis to it. Sometimes it does have that basis. Sometimes it's to do with people being molested as children and other tragic experiences that they may have had. But that's not really the point. The point is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving everybody one particular obstacle that they need to identify, first of all. Everybody needs to think, what is the worst thing that I do that is holding me back from really being open in my ibadah? And we have to deal with that before we'll successfully deal with the other things. So uh, some people have been given that particular ibtila. And if they overcome the impulse, maybe they'll never get married because they just don't have that particular inclination. Um, but if they overcome that impulse and don't act in accordance with them, then they're not sinners. They're Muslims equal to any other Muslim. And the fact they have that, in, uh, that inclination is not in itself a sin. It's only putting it into practice that is sinful. Because uh, a bad intention is not punishable in Islam. Only a bad action is punishable. Good intention is rewarded as is a good action. This is part of Allah's mercy. So it's not a question of being phobic or being prejudiced against people who have that tendency. Uh, it's rather a question of standing up for fundamental rules about what it is to be human and uh, helping people who have the wrong kind of inclinations to work out their own particular path to salvation without engaging in things that are inherently ugly and outrage the basic dyadic principle of creation, the, the dhakar and the untha. So these are some of the, the issues that, that arise, and there are many others, because ours is such a, an age of, uh, of imbalance, even in these most fundamental, obvious things. The youngest child knows the difference between male and female is really important. The youngest child tends to play with male toys or female toys. These are very deep-rooted things in the human condition. So... Where we go on from this, I think, is uh, a counterattack. Uh, if you defend always, as any military strategist will tell you, you will eventually be defeated. If you wish to survive from time to time, you need to go on the offensive. And our uh, stance in Western societies at the moment is overwhelmingly one of either defensiveness, yet another conference on Islam, the religion of peace. Or it's um, a kind of angry lashing out against the evil kuffar, which doesn't do us any good at all, and is not part of the adab of Islam with the Ahlul Kitab anyway. We need to develop a third strategy, and one that I think is based not so much on proclaiming those issues that are most important to us, but looking at what the ambient society is suffering from most and seeing where uh, Islam can offer a, a remedy. So we need to be counter-attacking. We need to say, what about the alcohol industry? Why is it that there is so much uh, domestic violence caused by alcohol? What can we do about that? Why is it that so many food crops are turned for the production, turned over to the production of alcohol? Why is it that so many people are making money out of alcohol? Why is it that there is so much crime, violence, etc., etc., war crimes associated with alcohol? We need to stage counterattacks of, of, of that kind. We also need to think, I think, about the institution of a family and be righteously indignant at those who are angry about the Muslim family, Muslim attitudes to gender, and assume that we are nothing other than the Taliban caricature. 
we need to present our model of life, particularly, I think, to intelligent young people who are angry at a world that is not giving them any guidance at all. And I mentioned earlier the gratitude that one notices, particularly with young women who come into Islam, finding that at last they, can, they know what it is to be a woman and to be dignified, not to be a sex object, and to have uh, a future uh, with a man who knows that he has certain sharia responsibilities which he can't shirk. So I think these are some examples, and there are many others. We, it, we shouldn't be pessimistic and assume that all we can do is to defend ourselves endlessly against the barbs and arrows of outsiders. Uh, instead, I think we need to be uh, taking the initiative a little bit more. Other, otherwise, all we'll be doing is answering questions uh, on the basis of a set of allegedly shared liberal presuppositions and questions that uh, we need to answer on our own terms and not on theirs. I think that's all I wanted to say about the um, Kitab Kasra Shahwatain. Uh, but I know there were quite a few questions for the previous session, and uh, perhaps since I'm, inshallah, regretfully leaving uh, tomorrow morning, this is my last um, opportunity to be uh, honored with your presence, that uh, inshallah you can fire off some more questions. Uh, and inshallah there'll be some benefit. So let's uh, see what we have. In terms of marriage, you mentioned that one should be thankful for the spouse you have and not be picky. However, many people have specific criteria for choosing a spouse in order to have compatibility. And this, as some argue, may be the reason why many unmarried Muslims, why many unmarried Muslims are in our community. How do you balance choosing a good spouse but not being too focused on the criteria? Well, there's no easy um, formula for this. And in my experience, 90% of the Muslims who are kind of in their 30s or 40s who haven't found the right person, it's not their fault. It's the fault of um, perhaps parents who haven't helped them out enough or haven't understood them. Or it's the fault of masajid, Muslim organizations, uh, older relatives, spiritual guides who've not um, been able to help these young people find the right sort of person. But sometimes I think also it is because we're too fussy, that we have a, a long checklist of things that she must be. And I've known people who've insisted, oh, she has to know Ibn Arabi back to front. And she has to be a supermodel, and she has to be a super chef, and she has to be blah, blah, blah. And usually that's just uh, men uh, expressing their own high opinion of themselves. <laughs> uh, and uh, they're in trouble, first of all, because they're just going to, if everybody accepted those criteria, most women would never find husbands. And secondly, because when they finally find Miss Perfect, she is um, going to mess up on something and he'll feel that he's not quite got what he deserves. And that's a disaster. Uh, I think instead we need to be looking for people who have a kind of basic goodness and humility, not fuss too much about how formally religious people are. We shouldn't say, oh, he's not um, extremely religious, or we shouldn't say, oh, she's not wearing hijab. What's important is the quality of the soul. Uh, and in the longer term, who knows how people will develop. Maybe she will wear the hijab, maybe she won't. These are not the most important things. Most important things is the, the, the sincere believing male soul with the sincere believing female soul um, hoping to please Allah together and just get along and create a good, good family and be loving towards their children. But these long checklists, and I'm told you even see them on these uh, Islamic marriage sites. What are your criteria? What are you looking for? Um, uh, really quite worrying because, in fact, a lot of the really excellent Muslim marriages that you see that have lasted for decades are often between people who seem to be very different and incompatible in many ways. It's, it's a subtle thing. It's not something that you can quantify. It's not, it's not an academic decision. When Imam al-Ghazali states that gluttony is the source of all human uh, destruction, is he talking from his own personal experience? Um, I don't know. He doesn't say that. 
Neither does he mention it in his uh, uh, in his uh, autobiographies, but uh, it presumably is based on some experience that he must have had with himself when he was the top professor in his army in Baghdad and eating with the Khalifa. And gluttony is not about just the quantity that you eat, but your attitude to the food, a sense of real entitlement and a sense of gobbling it all up, even if it doesn't last very long, and really being having a kind of craving, a uh, bestial desire to grab the food and to stuff it inside oneself. Um, so that's quite possible, but I hadn't thought of it in those terms, whether this is part of his own experience. In the abyss of the modern culture, should we, and especially those working with the community, take the other extreme of getting uh, the TV and the like out of the homes with the intention of bringing about a cultural and ethical balance. Um, again, this is a, a, a tricky one because uh, there is some merit in the argument which says that for children, for instance, they need some kind of inoculation, that you need to give them a little bit of the virus so that they can withstand the full disease. And that if you bring them up as kind of angelic, luminous, uh, beings who've never seen or thought of or heard of anything haram, when they finally go into the real world, which they have to sooner or later, they won't really have developed any kind of immunity against the stuff that's out there. Um, uh, if you homeschool them, you can keep them away from it for a bit longer, but sooner or later they're going to go to university, you're not going to give them a home university education presumably. Sooner or later they're going to go out there <laughs> And they do need to have some kind of awareness and some kind of experience within themselves from an early age of knowing what to look at, what not to look at, when to turn it off, when to... That, that basic discipline. Otherwise, you may find that they get into more serious uh, difficulty. So again, I guess it's the principle of Khairul Umuri al Satoha. The best of matters is the, the middle course. What are the principal virtues Muslims should be practicing on the path to acquiring the gift of wisdom? Well, it's just the usual virtues of Islam. It's the the Sunnah. It's um, trying to see uh, Allah's works in as many things as possible. So you don't have a secular perception of the world. You see everything in sacred terms. Look at what Allah is doing. I wonder why Allah did that. What is the wisdom in this? Uh, s sacralizing your perception of your daily life. Um, I think that's an important way forward. But again, acquiring the gift of wisdom, it is a gift, and one doesn't acquire a gift as such. And some people seem to be practicing Islam outwardly very well, but sometimes they take some very unwise decisions, and we all do that frequently. Wisdom is something that uh, comes and goes. How does one know they are acting out and internalizing the virtues in the way Allah and his messenger intended? Um, you assume that you're not. Uh, you have, we all have the need to be secure. We can't be kind of frightened and miserable creatures. But our security should come from the fact that we know Allah's good intentions towards us and the intercession of the Prophet ﷺ for our sins. Our security shouldn't come from any reliance on our own deeds or on our own intentions. If we rely on our own deeds, then we're really in trouble. If we have a high opinion of our own religiosity, <laughs> then we're really in trouble. We approach the prayer by saying, Oh Allah, this is the best I can do, and it's kind of rubbish that I'm offering you, but this is the best I can do. But I know that you're Ghafoor and Rahim, which is why our impulse, as soon as we finish the prayer, is to say, Astaghfirullah, 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 because we know we didn't do it right. What he deserves in his absoluteness and his <coughs> glory is far beyond anything that all humanity put together could hope to offer him. So Astaghfirullah is what we say in the knowledge that he is Ghafoor al-Rahim, Qabil al-Tawb, the acceptor of, of repentance. I don't know if I understood this, but did you say that the desire some people Muslims have for the opposite gender is something put in by Allah as a test that they must overcome? Um, maybe I wasn't very clear. I was saying uh, that if somebody is tried with uh, 
the misfortune of sexual attraction to somebody of the same gender, then that has to be treated as a test that they have to overcome. It's not something that they can, uh, can succumb to. Um, I'm just a little confused about the, the point of Allah having tested them with that. Well, this is in his wisdom. Um, why are some people tested with aggressiveness, other people with absent-mindedness, some people with not being very bright? Often you can't, you can't tell. This is from uh, the perspective of the divine knowledge, which perceives things from above in their perfection, something that we on our kind of two-dimensional uh, mode of existence can't usually grasp but our, we don't need to understand in a sense why did Allah make me like this what we need to understand is the problems that we have and figuring out ways of dealing with those problems we need to be practical rather than just theorizing everything is it correct to say that the essence of the female lies in her ability to carry the soul of a child if so does this miracle make her complete what would you say then about a woman unable to bear a child? Well, uh, human beings through Allah's decree are diverse. Uh, you can nonetheless say that there are general generalizations that it is possible to make about big categories such as gender. Of course there are exceptions. Uh, but in those exceptions, and you have to look at individual cases, you can see that there are ways in which a particular possibility which has been thwarted nonetheless expresses itself in a different way. And it may be that this is a particular trial and the way in which that woman overcomes that trial, if she does it with serenity and acceptance, that is what opens the gate of paradise to her. Similarly, there may be men who are incapable of um, all kinds of things. There may be men who are impotent through no fault of their own. There may be men who are that are not able to fight jihad because they were born in a state of uh, being physically handicapped. There are, this is the nature of, of the Bani Adam, that the spectrum includes types of um, uh, things that are, that, are, that, that are marginal. But that doesn't affect the fundamental principle. So um, uh, it's a good question, but uh, I think think that the answer has to be that it's the, the, the question of the infertile woman is not theologically distinct from the question of a human being who finds that there are other things that they can't do. Why there are some people who are born with, um, say, uh, extraordinary abilities in some areas but less abilities in others. This is just how Allah distributes his uh, decree. Allah makes whom he will to be sterile. Um, but it is not something that affects the capacity for sanctification or for salvation. Are there any examples from the prophetic tradition of dealing with individuals with certain sexual orientations? Um, well, the, the, it's not an issue of a, a, a had punishment as such, but uh, the, the, way, the usual position in Islamic law is uh, that uh, the practice, the verified practice, that is to say with the four witnesses, uh, carries the death penalty. But there are different views in the Sharia. So journalists and others who are out to have a go at us who say that Muslims want to kill gays are not uh, correct because the Islamic legal literature provides uh, on the one hand a range of possible punishments for these uh, offences uh, but it also makes it extremely difficult to prove them and also the famous hadith in Tirmidhi, Idra'ul Hudud bi Shubuhat, avoid the severe punishments by means of finding ambiguities, which one almost invariably can find. Uh, it's also worth noting that these practices were generally uh, easier to find and less frowned upon by society in traditional Muslim cultures than in traditional Christian cultures. Christianity always much more buttoned up about anything to do with sexualities. sexuality. As Muslims, should we stay away from homosexuals altogether or be good to them in the hope that they may change? Um, I don't know that I have uh, an answer, except to say that it's not, it's not a single category. There are some people who 
clearly in their nature and their comportment and the way they behave and the way they dress and move. It's something very deep and innate within them. With others, it might be just a lifestyle option. And that increasingly is, is, is common. People are kind of uh, mobile in their sexuality nowadays. Um, with the innate homosexual, uh, very often there will be something disturbing about that person's presence, which people of various religions have noted, in which case you may not necessarily wish that person to be your best friend. However, the responsibility of da'wah is never suspended. Don't think that they can't become Muslim, or that they're not craving God. They are just the same as everybody else. So just pushing them away uh, is going to possibly get in the way of their salvation. But uh, we have to deal with increasing, increasingly strange situations. Um, for instance, my wife was at an interfaith conference a few years ago, and uh, there was a, uh, a Christian who had, I think, been a, a priest and then had a sex change and then said that she was a woman and wanted to be with the women when they were taking their hijabs off, the Muslim women. And there was a kind of big question about exactly what this organism was, whether it was male or female, to take their hijabs off. So I don't have an answer to, to those things. These are really tricky. Uh, Islamic viewpoint on masturbation is not something that Mamul Ghazali deals with. There's a difference of opinion, as I understand it, amongst the madahib. Some consider it to be absolutely forbidden. Um, some allow it in the case of uh, people, particularly men, who are afraid that they might fall into zina if they don't have uh, some form of sexual release. Online questions. Ah, oh, yes, I forgot that we were going global. Uh, is it compulsory to get married? even if it's not happening and one uh, is willing to get into such a relationship, what if Allah didn't plan for it but something better than that? One can stick to gratitude and patience as the Lord requires. Um, and nikah or sunnati, uh, hadith says, the nikah is my sunnah. This is part of following the prophetic way. But it's not correct to say that it's really compulsory. And there have been ulama, as I mentioned, great ulama who didn't marry. Sometimes people can have a medical condition, which means that they realize it's wise for them not to get married. Uh, and there are cases in Islamic history of, of that happening. Um, but generally, the, 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 the impulse of the Muslim should be that one wishes to see the blessing of new life, the, the, the presence of a new generation, to be part of the chain of being, to give pleasure to one's own parents by completing... Uh, one's own part of, of, of the extended family, and also to uh, have somebody with whom to worship, somebody who is same but different, the joy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed should be the process whereby new life is brought into the world. He could have made things very different. He could have said human life will come about through, I don't know, um, uh, the the laying of a, an egg or something like that and it could have been something very mechanical there could have been one gender this is the way he's uh, created it and it's something that we are required to take joy in and to aspire to yeah we are starting to get into sort of straightforward nikah issues now whereas Ghazali's point is not so much about that, but about how we deal with the problem of physical desire. Um, but here's one. What are the guidelines in approaching a girl for marriage in this uh, time? To get to know her without making a drastic step, like asking her father, um, because the girl's reputations um, very quickly in situations such of engagement. Um, I don't think this is to do with orf. This is something to do with people's own customary expectations. Uh, one has to respect the expectations of one's family and uh, one's prospective spouse's family. Uh, but in terms of exactly how one gets to know her, how much time you spend with her beforehand, uh, issues of email, Facebook, telephones, meetings, how many meetings, there is no single Islamic ruling on that. And to some extent it has to be left to the conscience of, of the individuals.
Do you believe in getting married at a young age? Um, how important is financial stability? Can you get married uh, from loans until you graduate from school and work? Those are all important questions, mashallah. Um, certainly in many parts of the Islamic world, the reason why most people don't get married until their 30s is, until their 30s is because the financial impositions that are placed upon them by a certain middle-class bourgeois respectability. She can't get married until her husband has the furnished flat and the car and all of the things that go with that. And to some extent, you know, of course, the, the girl has the right to be maintained in a situation of dignity, but very often uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the threshold is set much too high. Um, and the Holy Prophet وسلم, says, whoever can get married should do. Uh, and if he does not, then there will be man jaakum tardawna dinahu khulaqahu fazawwiju. If somebody comes to you and you are pleased with his deen uh, and his akhlaq, then you should allow him to marry your daughter. Otherwise, there will be corruption in the earth and fitna. Uh, too many unmarried people. Uh, in society is a source of instability and causes loneliness, suffering, all kinds of other problems. It's natural for people to be married. Marriage is the natural state for human beings. Uh, being single is not the, the natural state. Um, so very often, yeah, it becomes horribly expensive. And the average Asian wedding in Britain now costs £85,000. Um, often the Hindus spend more than Muslims, but still there's two trips to Karachi or Bombay to buy the dress, and then there's the hotel, which is £20,000, and then all of the suites and stuff. And uh, in the end, usually people look kind of grumpy in those suits. <laughs> Generally, they're sitting around, the food comes, it's a bit slow, and it's kind of a ritual that people go through. If it wasn't so expensive, that would be all right. But I think that we need to de-ritualize and simplify our marriage practices and make it easier for people to marry uh, at a younger age. Is it allowed to look at a woman if you do not feel lust and desire? Um, yes, I guess. Um, but how often does that happen? Um, I mean, it, it is an issue. There's a serious issue here in the case of medics, for instance. You have to examine somebody from the opposite sex. You might have to do it every day. Um, and uh, doctors who I've spoken to about this say, yes, it, after a while you do just see a patient uh, and... Um, any responsible doctor will know that you have to acquire the ability to switch off the element of, of desire. That's just part of um, professional responsibility. Of course, often easier said than done, um, but it, it, it can be done. Is there an extreme form of doing good deeds for the love of Allah? I know this is the way we attain wisdom, but I knew someone who stated that we should worship Allah not to get paradise or avoid hell but rather out of gratefulness to our Lord. They don't desire Jannah, they just love God so much. That's why they worship him. Is this praiseworthy or extreme? Uh, I think it's based on a misunderstanding, at least um, as this has been phrased. It's not as if paradise is an alternative to Allah. The way in which you experience and take joy in the presence of your Lord in the next world is that that is the greatest of the joys of paradise. Uh, the ru'ya the vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is part of the Sunni aqidah, we get to see Allah in a way that to us is, of course, unimaginable, is part of the, the package of paradise. That's what it is. It's the supreme aspect of paradise. And everything else in paradise is what it is precisely because of the divine presence. So it's not either or. It has to be both and. Moderation is the encouraged path. Does this still apply when we reach an advanced age? Um, I think so. Um, it, it depends really on how people's accumulated actions have uh, affected them when they reach, um, say, their 70s, their 80s, 
the 90s. We tend to be the consequence of the accumulation of things that we recurrently did. Uh, so it may well be, if we'd led a dissolute life, that when we're old and we realize that the grave is, is, is waiting for us, uh, that we need to make amends by uh, making a big effort, doing Omrah several times, praying a lot, and really uh, exerting ourselves. Um, but that's not extreme. That's just an expression of penitence. On the topic of hunger, athletes are always kept under the impression that they have to eat more than normal people. How can an athlete benefit from disciplining himself through hunger while at the same time not negatively affecting his athletic life? Um, I've never been in this situation, so I can't um, uh, comment. But uh, uh, in that case, the athlete would be eating for a legitimate reason. And a more Islamic example might be somebody who has to fight in a battle. Uh, the morning of the battle, you have to eat a really good breakfast because you don't know when you're next going to get a meal and you have to have physical strength. That's not uh, indulgence. That's uh, just common sense and, uh, and, and, and proper preparation. Okay, in regard to sexual desire, could there be an excess when one is married? Um, it's interesting, um, one of the things that got Pope John Paul II into hot water was that he spoke a lot about the dangers of lust within marriage, and people didn't really understand that. Um, uh, Imam Nawawi says, uh, all desires harden the heart with the exception of sexual desire which softens it. So in principle, it's not, it, it can't be done to excess unless it's getting in the way of earning a living, caring for children, doing one's own uh, one's other responsibilities. It's, it's not in itself a destructive thing like, for instance, eating too much. Uh, was Tariq al-Jalwa characteristic of all the companions of the Prophet? Of most of them, I would say, but there are some uh, who uh, were known for an isolation. And to some extent, the Ashab al-Sufa uh, were people who were detached from many of the normal alaiq relations of the world. Um, they were these people who lived in the veranda attached to the house of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were the, the fuqara. Uh, mostly of the, the, the Muhajireen and people who came from tribes outside Medina. Uh, individuals such as Awais al Qarani, I guess, uh, Salman al Farisi to some extent, Abu Dharr al Ghifari. These are people whose spiritual excellence was in large measure uh, cultivated through a certain detachment. You mentioned wisdom based on maintaining a balance between two extremes. Can you please state an indicator or two that would alert us that we're drifting too far to one end? Um, I wish I... I think it's something to do with the, the fitra. It's to do with asking a fatwa of one's heart. If you are on the website, there's an earthquake somewhere, and you want to know... What is an appropriate donation? You don't want to give too little, but you know that you can't give everything that you've got. So what exactly do you do? And I think that that's where one's conscience, one's sense of appropriateness as a Muslim, one's individual moral autonomy comes in. There's no specific sharia instruction on something like that, and no rule of thumb that would say everybody has to give exactly the same sum of money. So to the extent that we have... Um, a healthy internal life, that we're not spiritually sick, we should be able to work these things out. And ultimately what counts is not whether it's 50 pounds or 500 pounds, it's whether we have the right kind of intention and we're really thinking responsibly about uh, the donation that we're giving. And even if it's a relatively small amount, uh, what makes a difference uh, in the world of sadaqa, and those who've worked with Islamic charities have seen this, is not actually the amount of money, but the kind of intention and the spirit with which it's given. And you see this, for instance, in mosque projects. Sometimes little communities have a small amount of money, 
and they give what they can and they build a masjid that's very simple and humble where the atmosphere is wonderful and sometimes there's other communities which have been given 30 million dollars by the emir of somewhere um, but somehow the atmosphere inside never quite takes off spiritually so it's not really about uh, amount it's about uh, intention and the baraka. It seems that gay rights are consonant with the foundations of liberal secular societies. As citizens of these societies, who profess a commitment to these societies, their laws, how are we to balance our rules of citizens' personal ethics that view gay rights as improper? Well, democracy is supposed to be about freedom of expression and freedom of conscience, and as long as you're not advocating violence or maltreatment or um, hate speech, you're entirely within your right to say that you don't approve of the actions of those people. It's not illegal and you're not alone because there are very many people, even quite secular people, who don't like those practices either but because of a certain political correctness in the public sphere they're browbeaten into silence. That, uh, the position of the Roman Catholic Church, the biggest Christian denomination, continues to be that it is an objective disorder and they get a lot of stick for that but they don't mind because this is their doctrine so we're not alone it's the same with traditional rabbinical Jews um, with Tibetan Buddhists and and others but they can still be citizens fully paid up committed citizens of liberal democratic uh, states and uh, political processes while holding views that happen to be the views of minorities rather than the mainstream This is another interesting one. These have, I think, all been good questions. Do you know of anyone before Ghazali who spoke of these two desires as the most difficult to manage, and particularly gluttony as number one? Um, I think you may find something in uh, Abu Talib al-Makki, Qut al-Qulub, where he deals with uh, the issue of hunger. It is a certain uh, type of, uh, particularly Khorasanian, ascetical tradition that's particularly concerned about food and very often in that tradition also it's to do with uh, the wara scrupulousness in not just the quantity of food and not desiring it excessively but also absolutely insisting on it being halal and historically the Sufis in particular are very very zealous that they only consume um, halal food which Imam Ghazali talks about um, elsewhere in the Ihya. How much has Imam Ghazali been influenced by Aristotle? Much of what he says about the middle way sounds very similar to the idea of the ethical meaning and the ethics. The example of courage mentioned by Aristotle. Well, Imam Ghazali's quotations are not from Aristotle. Uh, they're from the Qur'an and the Hadith. And where the Qur'an says, وَابْتَغِي بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ سَبِيلَ Follow a middle path between the two. Um, it's not being Aristotelian. This is Semitic revelation. Uh, however, Imam al-Ghazali was part of a great civilization that was interested in the uh, intellectual productions of earlier civilizations and wanted to see how those earlier ideas and systems of thought could be useful to the Muslims. So logic, for instance, in his Mustasfa, he uses a lot of logic, which is essentially from the organon of Aristotle, because he found logic an effective way of relating to and expounding certain fiqh issues. Um, similarly with the ethics, much of uh, Imam Ghazali's treatment of ethics as the discovery of the median uh, is articulated before him by somebody called Aradab al-Isfahani uh, and by somebody called Miskaway in Kitab Tahdib al-Akhlaq. And Miskaway certainly had read uh, Hunayn bin Ishaq's Arabic translation of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics where um, you find the classical examples of the definition of, of arete, virtue as a median point between two extremes. But in fact it's, it's fairly common, if not normative, in global ethical systems to find virtue as defined as a median point between two extremes. So Ghazali is uh, following in the mainstream Islamic tradition, the Sirat al-Mustaqim is the middle way Ummatan Wasata, with the Ummah of the middle, not too far to this side, not too far to that side, 
wabtaqi bayna dhalika sabila but he finds it useful to express himself sometimes in terms of the ethical system that was known to educated arab intellectuals at the time which is expressed in terms uh, of the aristotelian legacy As an Islamic scholar, what is the cure when one loses interest in one's spouse? Well, again, there's no single medicine for that. It depends on the reason, depends on the individual. If the spouse is committing adultery, then one has a good reason for losing interest in the spouse. If the spouse um, has, is doing something that isn't sinful, that one isn't interested in, or if one is oneself to blame, then it's an is a different issue. So there is no single remedy for this. Um, uh, divorce is not haram, but as the hadith says, uh, Rahman." Divorce shakes the throne of Ar Rahman. It is abghadul halal. It is a last resort. Um, so, if there really is no love and no interest in continuing a loveless relationship to keep. You know, the children on an even keel and children do get gigantically damaged by divorce as I see with my own students in Cambridge that whenever one of them is in tears or having problems or darting disorders or cutting herself or whatever usually it's because they're problems between uh, parents um, the one has to treat it as a last resort um, but in some cases it, it, it's necessary otherwise um, it does depend on the individual there is no single over-the-counter medication for this one. It has to be a prescription drug based on a proper diagnosis of the individual's problem. Online question. How do you identify the weakness in yourself in order to overcome, to elevate the spiritual self? I guess this is related to the idea that I was floating about everybody having, uh, again, Aristotle would say, hamartia, a fatal flaw the Achilles heel. Uh, and I think it is, I mean, logically speaking, everybody has one thing that they do that is worse than the other things that they do. We all have uh, a, a mortal sin. And we need to engage in muhasaba. We need to listen to what our good friends are telling us about ourselves rather than pushing them away angrily just as critics. Very often our friends are the ones who tell us our faults. Um, uh, Sayyidina Omar, radiallahu an said that he would only keep the company of people who would speak frankly to him about his faults. Uh, so we need that. Uh, sometimes parents, family can tell us. But we also have to have a, a spiritual alchemy within ourselves that notices when we're going up and going down in terms of our Iman. Because it tends to be what we do that affects the level of our Iman. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ لَنَا Allah says, those who struggle for us, we will guide them to our paths. If you make an effort and you're trying to overcome your weaknesses, um, Allah will give you hidayah and the blessing of faith. Um, but if you persist in something that really you know is wrong, but you just keep on doing it, uh, mudmin, your uh, recidivist, um, then that is going to make it very difficult for you to have a really sound and flourishing and joyful spiritual life. You have to get rid of that um, elephant on the table before you can do anything else and usually we know what it is usually we know there's one thing that we feel bad about that we have to deal with but we haven't got around to dealing with yet St. Augustine's famous prayer oh God make me good but not yet um, yeah, there's no not yet it's, it's now now which books of Ghazali would you recommend personal studies. Well, the Ihya on Medina is certainly the, the, the towering uh, monument of his legacy. The ulama say, Al-Ihya u Shaykh man la Shaykh Allah. The Ihya is the Shaykh of he who has no Shaykh. If you haven't had the good fortune to find a man and a woman of spiritual depth who can guide you, give you Irshad, the Ihya on Medina has a remarkable capacity to uh, affect you, to influence you, and people have found that because of the incredible intention which Imam Ghazali put into this book, that it's kind of, it glows, it has an effect, even nine centuries on. So with the Ihya al din and many of the books, perhaps half of the Ihya has now been translated. And of course, you can now get the DVDs, um, 
commercial break, Travelling Light. Uh, £24.95 for a DVD set of, of four, which is a very good deal. Or you can download the soundtracks from the Mishkat Media website. And alhamdulillah, we're actually finding that Ghazali has a gigantic impact. A friend of mine is a, uh, an Orthodox priest who's been trying to understand Islam. And he says only when he read Ghazali's Ihya al Madin that he really started to understand and to, to respect what Muslims are about. And uh, for new Muslims also, Imam Ghazali is so full of wisdom that they tend to respond to it much better than they do if they're given, for instance, the Mufti of Saudi Arabia's free booklet on Ahkam al is how you prepare people for the dead, which you can get for free, but which isn't necessarily the first thing that people need to be exposed to. Alhamdulillah, I think that Aisha will be short shortly and I've been told something drastic about not being allowed to get on the taxi tomorrow unless I've led a brief dhikr or something is that what, what's the expectation how little can I get away with mm -hmm. let me see thank you all for your questions alhamdulillah I think that they uh, added an important dimension and may Allah heal all of the Broken hearts. Captive audience. Alpha <coughs> Tiha. <coughs> لا إله إلا الله 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 اللهم صل وسلم مبارك على سيدنا محمد بو عشق بیر بحر آمان دل بو عشق بیر بحر آمان دل بو نخان دو کنار آلماز بو نخان دو کنار آلماز صلات الله سلام الله صلات الله سلام الله عليك يا رسول الله 
Aleyke ya Habiballah Delilim sırrı kol andır Delilim sırrı kol andır Bunu bilen de ağır olmaz Bunu bilen de ağır olmaz Salatullah selamullah Salatullah selamullah Aleyke ya Resulallah Aleyke ya Habiballah Seyfullah sözünde mestir Seyfullah sözünde mestir <gülüyor> Şeyhinden aldığı destir Şeyhinden aldığı destir <gülüyor> Salatullah, selamullah Salatullah, selamullah Aleyke ya Resulallah Aleyke ya Habiballah Allah'ıma takabal minna inne kente semiyu al alim. Mutub aleyna ya mağlana inne kente tuvabu rahim. Allah'ıma inna emseyna minke fi na'amatin ve afiyetin ve satr. Fe etmem na'amatika aleyna ve afiyetika ve satrka fi dunya ve al-akhira. Allah'ıma ente rabbi la ilahe ila ent. Khalaqtani ve ana ala ahdika ve wa'dika ma istata'at. A'udhu bika min şerri ma sana'at. Abu'u laka bi na'amatika aleyya ve abu'u bi zanbi. فاغفر لي فإنه لا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت <coughs> اللهم إنا عبادك وبنو عبادك وبنو إمائك ماض فينا حكمك عدل فينا قضاءك نسألك بكل اسم هو لك سميت به نفسك أو أنزلته في كتابك أو علمته أحدا من خلقك أو استأثرت به في علم الغيب عندك أن تجعل القرآن العظيم ربيع قلوبنا وجلاء أحزاننا وذهاب همنا وغمنا وأن تجعل الحياة زيادة لنا من كل خير وأن تجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless you all, keep you all safe and inshallah benefit you inwardly and outwardly from this experience and return you to your peoples having learnt some of the fara'ids and the nawafil of the religion inwardly and outwardly inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <laughs>